So, why do the Aussies say, yeah, nah, and end every sentence with a question? I found a really good video, so let's find out. Accents are weird things, aren't they? Like, yep. I understand why different people from around the world end up speaking different languages, but why on earth are people ended up sounding different depending on where they come from? What? Bear in mind, in England, and, well, say Britain, you could drive, what, 10 miles down the road and have a completely different accent. Why do specific places affect the way we speak? It seems that accents come about when people have been living together for a long enough period of time and pick up on specific speech patterns from one another until eventually everyone in the community speaks in a similar way. Accents are way more than just the way we speak, however. Not only can an accent signify where we come from, but it can also signify what social economic background we come from too. In example, a rich person... Not... See, this is, this is an interesting thing as well because... Um... If you think of, of me, for example, now, compared to a northerner, I sound posh. However, let's talk about your background. I come from a working class family. Now, it's so many different things that can affect how you speak. Now, I, like I said, I think I don't really have an accent. And, and I do think I come, I, I, I do think I sort of speak posh-ish depending on who you are listening. Um, so there's so many different, it, it, yes, it's, it's where you're from. Yes, it's your, if you're working class or if you're upper class, middle class. And bear in mind, England has the class system and a poor person from the same part of London will most likely speak differently. They're truly fascinating things. This has, of course, led to some accents being more beloved than others. Undoubtedly, however, one of the most beloved accents has to be the one this video is all about, that being the dialect spoken by those from the land down under, the Australian accent. It really is one of those accents that pretty much everyone knows straight away, and everyone has attempted to do it themselves with varying degrees of success. Goodbye? That was dreadful. What I find most interesting about this accent is that it's not entirely native to the land. The modern nation of Australia is primarily made up of descendants from settlers from other parts of the world, much like other nations like the USA or Brazil. This is different to many other nations, which have inhabitants that have lived there for many years and have accents that are native to the land, like French and Irish in example. So where exactly did the Australian accent come from? To start with the official... What accent do in the indigenous um, the indigenous people speak? Do they speak the same the same Aussie accent as you normally hear from from basically from the white side of the country? Do they speak the same? Have they all have they picked it up from from living around um, the normal Aussie accent? language of the nation should give you a pretty clear idea as to where this story begins. While Aussies speak English, Australian English has very much become its own unique thing. Not only do they speak English, but the Union Jack is part of their flag too. If you haven't guessed by now, Australia and the United Kingdom are very much interlinked nations. Australia was in fact a colony of the British Empire from 1788 until 1901. This explains to us not only why they speak English, but also shows us how exactly that famous accent when i did the 50 australian things video i quite i questioned what was that island down there and obviously it's tasmania and it's funny because i got lots of comments joking and being mean about tasmania and i said it's almost like our our isle of Wight. if you look at the bottom of of england there is the isle of Wight, and it's almost the same sort of comments we do um you know the inbreds it's a joke, it's a joke, I promise. Or well, they're back in the 50s with uh, black and white TV still. ...started to take shape. As mentioned, the British colonisation of Australia started in 1788. It was in this year that the famous First Fleet arrived in the continent. This fleet of 11 ships left Portsmouth in the southeast of England on the 13th of May 1787, carrying over 1,400 inhabitants to their new home. At this time, Australia had no European settlement, so making the land habitable was quite the challenge for the people on these ships. 
separate question again then if you guys can answer because I don't know if this video is going to say now when when the British landed um, in Australia they obviously would have had their their own diseases and, and viruses and things like what happened in South America when the Europeans started settling in they took their their sicknesses basically their viruses and, and whatnot and the natives basically died out because they hadn't got an immune system um did anything similar happen to australia with the with the indigenous species the indigenous species no sorry that's that sounds rude um the indigenous people um did did the viruses hurt them on these 11 boats were a huge variety of people. There are high-ranking government and military officials who'd be running the operation once they landed in Australia, but these officials brought their families with them too. On top of this, you had the ship's crew members, but also people who'd fill important roles once they arrived in the land, like builders, cooks, and various other workers. Though most famously, of course, are the convicts on these boats <laughs> too. There were thought to be around seven to 800 convicts aboard the 11 ships of the first fleet. They were being sent to Australia simply due to the growing amount of prisoners in Britain. This is something we covered in much more detail in our video about Tasmania's strange name, so go check that out. To summarise, the British Empire used Australia as a plaster for their prisoner problem, rather than fixing the problem outright. Australia wasn't just a dumping ground for Britain's convicts, as various stereotypes I did depict. Regardless as to why there were convicts in Australia, they definitely were there, as well as many other people from fancy government officials and their fancy families to other various workers who were enlisted to create this new colony. All these people would have come from different parts of Great Britain and would have come from different social economic backgrounds too. This meant that not only did this huge variety of people arrive in Australia, but their huge variety of accents arrived in the land too. As I stressed, and it, this, this it probably will get onto, as I stressed, bear in mind, you know, you can... Hampshire has Hampshire where I am is here and you've probably got you've got probably two accents you've got a kind of a country bumpkin type accent and then you've probably got my sort of accent no real accent London has got a few um Devon then down to Cornwall straight away you're going not very far and the accent's changing up north you've got Geordie you've got Mank you've got um Scouse there are so many accents um, now, another question I would ask is, in Australia, do you have classes, as in working class, middle class, and upper class? Because, obviously, we have that. Now, obviously, as the video is saying, as the video is saying, we obviously sent lots of people of all different classes. You know, you had the government people, which were probably higher class. You had the convicts, which were probably lower class. The workers that were lower class. Do you... Do you have a working class, upper class, middle class sort of system that we have? Great Britain is home to many accents and dialects, despite its relatively small size. One source pointed out that there were up to 300 different accents on this island. These changes in voice can be seen on a large scale when comparing someone from the north, north to south to someone from the south. However, there are even slight differences in the way people speak in counties right next to each other. Even people from different boroughs of London can speak differently. Crazy, it's an isn't island it? full of a staggering amount of accents, and an awful lot of these accents made their way over to Australia with the first fleet. In the 18th century, people didn't travel as much as they do now, especially people from lower economic backgrounds. This meant that many of these people may have never heard some of these other British accents before, let alone understand them. Communicating with one another became quite a challenge. And it's hard enough to understand Northerners as it is. That's the thing. You're, you're, you're listening to some Scousers and some Geordies, you're like, what? What are you even saying? It's crazy. And when you are literally on the opposite side of the earth, trying to create a new community from scratch in the blazing Australian heat, you kind of need to be able to communicate with one another efficiently. From the fact that Australia is still around to this day, we can gather that these various people did manage to communicate with one another, despite the disparities in their dialect. How did they do this, however? 
Well, something happened to the way in which these various British people spoke their language. This something is known as dialect levelling. Dialect levelling is something that happens in the world of language and linguistics, in which various distinct variations of a language strip away the things that make them distinct for ease of understanding. Words present in one dialect but not in another would be removed, sort of, and other words that merge. pronounce differently in different accents would be levelled out and be said in a way that fits all the different dialects and accents. Removing all these quirks and traits in a language and getting to the bare bones of it really help people who speak the same language but in vastly different accents and dialects communicate with one another and this is exactly what happened in Australia and set the wheels in motion for the birth of the Aussie accent. This birth didn't happen overnight however, it was after 50 years from that initial European settlement of Australia that the accent that we all know and love started to appear. Those initial settlers still alive after 50 years would have undoubtedly changed the way they spoke but the real change of the accent would have come with descendants. It's after the generation and after generation, of the isn't it? Settlers who would have spent their entire life in the accent melting. It's using a few stereotypes. This the old cork hat. Pot that Australia had become. These children would have really sounded how Australians sound today. Of course, it was a huge mixture of accents that went into the creation of the Australian accent we have today. Though some dialects and accents are seen as being a bit more pivotal and had a larger influence in the sound of the speech today. It seems that the South East English accent is seen as one of the key players in the Aussie accent. This makes an Life. awful lot of sense. The first fleet left from Portsmouth, which is in the South East of England. Yeah, Portsmouth is literally a 20 minute drive. So similar accent, basically the same accent as I've got. Yeah. Southampton, Portsmouth, yeah. And the South East is one of the most popular parts of the country. The South East houses London, so many important figures and convicts on these boats would have arrived from the capital. More specifically in London, we have the Cockney accent too. Cockney is seen very much as the precursor of the Australian accent. There are definitely similarities between the two, that's for sure. Likewise, Scottish is seen as having a large influence on the Australian accent too. However, there's one huge omission I haven't mentioned in this video yet, and that's the native accent of the Australian Aboriginal. Originals. That's what I want to know. I've read conflicting things as to whether their accent affected the Australian accent. Some say it had a direct impact on the way Aussies speak, while other sources point out that it's the other way around. What language? This is what I'm saying. What language or accent would they, the Aboriginals have? What? What did? Did? Do you have a net? Did they have a name for their language? But even then, they probably there was probably more than one, more than one native to the land. You know, it was, it's such a vast area that people don't realise. Um, so there was probably Aboriginals scattered all over the place with all different languages themselves. While Aboriginal names and words are very present across Australia, it seems that accent isn't quite as abundant. Pretty much as soon as the accent emerged, it was instantly beloved. What's even more surprising is that when it first came about, Australian English and their Australian accent were seen by scholars of the time as the purest form of the English language. Really? This purity of the Australian accent goes back to the dialect levelling we mentioned earlier. The people of Australia had come to speak English without any of the local quirks that plague the various forms of English spoken in the UK. All because this accent and way of speaking was born out of a means to communicate easily and efficiently. Author of the story of Australian English, Kel Richard explained it best, saying that Australian English is English with the dialect variations taken out. Unfortunately, this love of the Aussie accent at its position as the purest form of English wouldn't stay around for too long. Across the 18th and 19th century, some huge changes were made to the English language and the way in which it was perceived. The most noticeable change was the introduction of the concept of received pronunciation known as RP for short. RP is known by many other names, BBC English, The Queen's English and Oxford English to name a few examples. Yeah, places like Hertfordshire. Hertfordshire is very much The Queen's English. That's real posh English. It's that definitively British accent spoken by the likes of the Queen and those who present the news on BBC. Very posh. It was in this period of time that RP was put on a pedestal and declared the definitive way of speaking the language. Not only was it seen as the definitive way of speaking English, but those who spoke with this kind of accent were seen as superior to other English speakers. Those who didn't speak like this in not just the UK but across the Empire in general were looked down upon. I think that's still I think that's still true today. Um, and actually, you know, Northerners and Southerners joke 
joke about each other. You know, we're soft Southerners and uh, and whatnot. But I think still today, if if you've got a Northerner with with an accent, he would look that person would get looked down more upon than than a Southerner with a with a not so much of a strong accent, should I say? Um, I think that's just the way it is. It's just the way it is, and and because an accent gives a perception of your class um, because our class system is is huge over here. It's worth noting here that despite being seen as the stereotypical way in which British people speak to this very day, very few British people actually speak in RP on a regular everyday basis. Very few. It's pretty much just the royal family and the rest of the upper echelons of British society at this point. Despite this, however, it meant that the once beloved Australian accent had gone from being seen as the purest form of English to being a rather harsh, rough and coarse accent. Sorry, Australia. Soon enough, RP was being taught in classrooms all across the empire, including Australia. Not only were young Aussies being taught to speak like this, but many posh Aussies started to use RP too, to distance themselves from their traditional Aussie accents, what was seen as unpleasant sounding in the time. Even once the country gained its independence from the UK in 1901, people were still trying to speak with an RP accent and sound less Australian. All this brings us to today. Luckily, nowadays there isn't as much stock put into RP, and by and large people aren't shamed or judged for the accents they have, at least they shouldn't be anyway. Luckily for us, RP's boost in popularity in the 19th century didn't wipe out the Aussie accent. Though what's so interesting about this dialect is that in its roughly 200 years of existence, not many variations of the accent have actually emerged. There are a few variations of the Australian accent, and the variations that do exist aren't particularly related to geography, like the accents of the UK or USA in example. The Aussie accent really doesn't change that much depending on where you are from. Uh, so I know you can get stronger Aussie accents, you know, really. <sighs> yeah, you can get stronger and, 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 and softer versions of the accent, but there's not really any differences. It's just how strong it comes comes on. Um, yeah, I don't know any. They all sound the same, more or less. Most sources claim that there are just three different versions of the Aussie accent, and these are more defined by social economic backgrounds as opposed to geographic backgrounds. Maybe you do have the these class three are system. General, broad, and cultivated. General Australian is by far the most common Aussie accent you hear. It's the way in which the vast majority of the nation speak. Someone like Hugh Jackman is a prime example of this kind of Aussie accent. Broad Australian is the accent spoken by people living in more rural areas, part of the nation that are more isolated and would have been less affected by RP and its influence in the 18th century. A great example of a broad Australian accent is with Steve Irwin. Cultivated Australian is perhaps the least Australian sounding of these three variations. It seems this accent is most linked with the high society of Australia, those whose ancestors did in fact pick up on RP all those years ago. I read that Kate Blanchett is a prime example of someone with a cultivated Now I'm trying to think of Kate Blanchett's accent. I can't even think what she sounds like now. Rated Australian accent. In all honesty, I didn't even know she was an Aussie. No. The history of this accent is an interesting one, that's for sure. From being born out of necessity for easy communication between people from vastly different backgrounds, to being considered the pinnacle of English, to being shunned thanks to RP, to being the beloved accent it is to this day. It's even evolved more so to become its own thing, with unique Australian words and phrases. In fact, you could call this form of English and the accent sweet as bro. That's what they say in Australia, yeah, no. right? Thank you to all my patrons. There we go. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. So I didn't realise, actually, I didn't realise how it's sort of all of the UK accents put into one and then dampened down. I, I, I didn't even think that. There's a few questions I asked. Hopefully you guys can answer. Um, like the Aboriginals, the in Indigenous, you know, what language did they speak? Did that what accent do they have how much of an influence did they have on the of the on the current australian accent um questions like that i'm sure some of you would have been taking notes and commenting as as you're watching the video um an interesting one it's learning about the history of australia um and what makes australia australia i hope you enjoyed um if you did like and subscribe join the discord buy me a coffee I've got some merchandise, etc, etc. It's all down below. It's all down below. I'll catch you next time.